I used to be pretty good at talking for hour after hour on anything, but it's getting a little tighter as, as I grow older. I don't like to take notes. Rhea Khanum told me, she said, you know, I, can't, I'm, I get so nervous when I'm going to speak. And I take notes and I detail all the notes, everything I'm going to say. And she says, then I fold it up and I put it in my purse. And usually I forget it. I've never turned to those notes. But in case I dry up and there's nothing else, I, go and find, I would go and find the notes. But she always then took off in a direction that she was inspired to go off on. And, uh, anybody who had the privilege of being in her presence and hearing her speak remember how spontaneous she was and how direct she was, very direct. Wonderful. We had, uh, yes, really, we had the great blessing of years of contact with her. Most of the time at the teaching center, she would chair the meetings of the teaching center. And Mr. Fortan was there, and Mr. Fahey, and Mr. Haney. It was interesting, the hands, chairing the hands in the meeting like that, <laughs> since they all had something individual to say on everything that you could think of. And uh, my wife also had the the bounty of uh, serving with Rahil Khanum in the master's house and helping with her photographic collection. I just can only imagine the immensity of that. We, we really had, had wonderful moments with the hands. And uh, Rahil Khanum, I think it's easy to say that uh, she was the greatest Baha'i woman we've had after the greatest holy leaf and definitely leaves her mark, a permanent mark on the cause. And, she was a helpmate of the guardian, but she was also, in a, in a sense, uh, she, she was a shield for him. It was the family turned so bitter. And of course, she'd been the object of much of their bitterness from the beginning, because they wanted Shoghi Effendi to marry his cousin, who had been w waiting and groomed for that, and Shoghi Effendi chose a Western woman, a Western woman of all things. <laughs> which meant the, the, the whole future was compromised, so to speak. <laughs> but he chose very well, and that was a great protection for him. But the uh, experiences that Shoghi Effendi and Rehanu never says that she went through that, but she went through the same thing with him. She said, she said once, she said, uh, for, there were 10 years from 1941 until 1951, she never saw the guardian smile. I've seen one photo of that period and his face is just ridden with grief and it's the middle of the period. The disappointment in him that the family turned away from him. She said that there were, there were times, you know, there'd be discussion in the family and show you if any would say, guide them or tell, give them some, some task or something. And the mother would interfere. She said, Shoghi Effendi, we know you're guardian, but is this the way? Is this the way? And that gradually corroded the effects of the covenant in the family. And when they went, they all went. You any little Baha'i out serving there somewhere internationally passed away, Shoghi Effendi wrote this eulogy of them. The mother passed, you didn't hear a word. The father passed, you didn't hear a word. But he couldn't really expel his parents, but they, they were certainly isolated from, from him and from the faith. They're buried in the cemetery in, in Haifa, and Riha Khanum, she never specify, but she said, I don't want to be buried in that cemetery with the enemies of the guardian. And uh, that was basically the parents she was talking about, but she's never pointed. And their graves are there, I and mean, they have the initials. They don't have any eulogy or, you know, all the graves have some statement from the guardian or from the master or somebody. They, they have just the initials on the parents' graves. What a tragic loss they were, really. I mean, to think how they, you know, Abdul Baha says in the will, to make Shoghi Effendi happy. He talks about making Shoghi Effendi happy. These people did just the opposite. And then you had the war on top of that, the World War, and then you had the War of Independence in, in Israel also, where one of the, one of the very blessed uh, people, he was a gardener, but he was a confidant of Shoghi Effendi. Shoghi Effendi could pour himself out. He trusted this man. 
and he was running across the street one time and was shot by whoever it was that was shooting in those days and died there on the threshold of the house. That was such lion of the forest of the love of God, Shoghi Effendi characterized him. Those were very difficult years. You know, the House of Justice has been greatly blessed. It's had a period free of those kinds of complications in the World Center. Um, could build up the World Center and has built up the World Center through your efforts, through your contributions, through the efforts of the Baha'is all over the world. They've had the funds to be able to to finish the ark, basically. There's one more building, but that building wasn't specified by Shoghi Effendi, except he said there would be such a building. We didn't know what it was for. The house has characterized it as a library, and then later they've called it the seed of a future institution of, of learning of the sciences and arts of the world and things of that sort, as distinct from the center of the holy study of the holy text, which is there, and in a sense replaces the building for the guardianship. You'll have this other institution, which will be a source of the recording of the great achievements of the Baha'i world in the fields of science and arts and things like that. This is kind of a promise of the future. We'll see how that works out. I don't think it's going to be get, get built right away. And then we were faced with this task of renovating the archives building and the, and the shrine of the Bob. And friends, these had fallen into terrible disrepair. They looked okay when you looked at them, but when you got up close and looked at the details, you saw that pieces had fallen off and there was a terrible state. I said to the house, it's so interesting, let's have a before and after film. Oh no, they said. <laughs> Other members said, it's, it's shameful if we show how bad it's gotten. <laughs> but it's all been fixed now. And now the attention will be focused on constructing the last of these great regional temples in Santiago, Chile. And I've been to the site just in December where the temple will be built. And it is, a, it is a, a marvelous site. And I was involved in early visits seven years before, and then each of the new possibilities and the problems which arose connected with each site. You don't even know about all the stages. I, the house never announced it. <laughs> but when we finally got this one settled, uh, there was a great relief. And it is a most perfect site. It isn't as if we had to give up the best site for something lesser than that. The first site, which was, we, we had presumed it wouldn't work anyway, but we went ahead with it because the government encouraged us. The ministers encouraged us. And that was the site in the park, right in the center of the city. There's a peak there of 700 meters. And they had said, well, that's the place for this temple, such a splendid temple. And the Catholic Church had quietly said, we don't think that's the place for the temple. <laughs> <laughs> the Virgin is two kilometers away, and she's at a higher point, but that will distract from her central, iconic position. But this created a marvelous stir in, the, in Chile. And now the temple is not even the temple. It's the temple, it's called. It's not called the Baha'i Temple anymore. It's the temple. How is the temple coming? When will the temple be built? It's so interesting. The public, there was debates in national television on the news programs, morning and evening. Will the temple make it through? Will it, what, what will happen? What's the next stage of the temple? Government speakers, senators who opposed, the Baha'i defendant who would come and defend and say, well, that's not true what they're saying. This is the case, and this is the case, and we want this to be of service to everybody, and so on. Finally, the president got, I think he got <coughs> leaned on a bit, and finally he, he removed his backing on the grounds that the temple was more than 16 meters high, and there was, it turns out there was a law somewhere saying that national parks couldn't have buildings over 16 meters high, so. It changed everything else to have the temple. I don't know why they couldn't change that, but they didn't change that. And so it was announced that it wasn't going to be possible to build it there. And the he headlines in the newspaper, the temple comes down from the mount. <laughs> <laughs> that gives you an idea of how much that was in public consciousness. And after that, the Sunday, the Sunday inserts had wonderful articles interviewing young couples, young Baha'i couples, how did you become a Baha'i, and 
these couples saying, well, we, you know, we weren't being satisfied by the Catholic Church, even so open. They print this, all of these things. Just, and talk about the, the activities in the Baha'i community. So there's this, there was this terrific uh, expectation about the, the Baha'i Temple. And the design is, of course, exquisite. And the architects that were involved in it with the with the architect from Canada, he had meetings with the Association of Architects and the Dean of Architects of the Catholic University was the one who told him, he says, this has to be in the city. It can't be 27 miles out in the desert, which is where it was going after the mount in the middle of the city. And so uh, gradually several, several other sites were explored until this one came, came available. Now it didn't come available for about five years after the project was uh, to be initiated. So there was a delay. But I like to think of it as a divine delay because it's better than any site that we looked at. It's perfectly ideal and it's south of the city there's, there's a kind of eternal springtime. It's, there's water, there's green. North of the city it turns into a desert. And so it's going to be a very beautiful spot. And subways come from the center of the city right to nearby it. Which, which the other thing costs about $12 to get to the site. We were worried about how the Baha'is will be able to go once a year. But this will probably mean that the public will attend it fairly regularly. And the design itself, the architects are saying this is, will become the iconic architectural symbol of South America. There isn't another building that comes close to it on the whole continent at this point. So we'll, we'll see how that develops. Some some divine delays have silver linings, I'm sure, and <laughs> blessings associated with them. And that's not my subject, but it is my subject because it is this is the interaction of light and darkness on the Chilean home front, you know, so to speak. <laughs> and the House of Justice is, has made a call in South America for for Baha'is, Baha'i couples that can settle in Santiago and help to enrich the, the uh, activities there to do so. And I think that can be extended to all of you. If any of you feel moved to move to Chile during this period and help with the activities, I'm sure you would be most welcome. All right, we have more of the same here. Progressive release of divine forces is one of the elements before us. The, I think that the whole mm, central point of this, this portion of the book and of the quotes that are, are associated with it is that it doesn't all happen at once. The, the infusion of these divine energies and potentialities into the world have certain triggers that release them and increase their flow in the world. It's not that they've lessened, it's they're, they're all there. They're just, there are certain steps that need to put, be put in place for them to act in their fullest manner. In fact, the fullest manner is the full splendor promised only in the Golden Age and with the birth of a Baha'i civilization. And those energies, Shoghi Effendi said, will, uh, will be drawn or will be released by the activities of the world order of Baha'u'llah. Now, you're, you're, you need to distinguish in your mind if you haven't been a careful student of Shoghi Effendi's writings, that the administrative order and the world order are two different things. The administrative order of the faith is what we have now, and it is the embryonic world order. But just as an embryo in the womb of the world, destined to be born into the form of world order in the future, it doesn't operate like it will when it's once a fully born child. It is busy developing organs and um, possibilities within the womb of the world. And the administrative order, with the House of Justice as its head, directs the Baha'i affairs of the world. Not yet in full accord with the Kitab Yaktas, not in conflict with it, because it, indeed it's been written in tablets that these laws and ordinances would come into the world gradually, and that some of them are revealed by Baha'u'llah for a different state of society in the future, when, when there are majority uh, populations of Baha'is in different countries. And uh, 
they would then have the blessings of living under the, the full system of the Kitabi Akhtas. But that, that takes some centuries to come about. Shoghi Effendi had talked about this, the initial stages, uh, as, as uh, first obscurity, the first state of the faith is nobody knows what it is. People would go to different places and nobody had ever heard the name Baha'i, and then they started talking about it. And gradually, that unmitigated, he says in one place, unmitigated obscurity. I mean, it was really obscure. Obscure. I think those who have been around as long as my wife and I know that when you mentioned Baha'i back in the 50s, People looked a little miffed like, oh. But they didn't say, what is Baha'i? They felt they better not get into that, you know, like. <laughs> but now, after so many years, 50 years, almost, it's, you have people that you mentioned on the plane to someone. And you're, you're I, I mean, I find myself in a position to say, if they say, that, oh, I haven't heard of that, to say, that's surprising, you know, there's been so much. <laughs> As if you're not a very wide red person, are you? you know? <laughs> and that it may be worth your while to in inform yourself about what it is. You know, I don't know whether you'd be interested in it or not, but at least it's a player in the world. You need to know what's going on. <laughs> so, so this unmitigated obscurity gradually gives way to persecution of the faith. As it becomes known what it is, forces of darkness arise against it. And so Gifendi, in his messages, which are concomitant to the course we're studying, but not the center of it, he talks about the cycle of crises and victories. And this happens at the international level of the cause. And he describes in God Passes By, you know, the influence of what happened to the Bab, the martyrdom of the Bab, and the killing of all these Baha early Babis and so on was the crisis and the victory was the appearance of Baha'u'llah's revelation in the Seer Chal. And he, he goes through series like that. He talks about them in this, and there's a cyclical development. And the outbreaks of persecution and sometimes the opposition to the covenant, certainly the opposition to the covenant, a terrific crisis that Abdu'l Baha faced from Muhammad Ali was resolved by Abdu'l Baha's historic and unprecedented trip to the West, three years of, of activities in the Western world, proclaiming the faith, the center of God's covenant, the pure mirror of Baha'u'llah's presence, moving amongst the masses of mankind. That was a mission which was a failure, Shoghi Effendi said, and the Baha'is dropped their jaws. What? And he said, not Abdul Baha's failure, the people's failure to respond to him, because he was what he was. and. They'd get excited about it in meetings and get all thrilled and excited, and then they'd go out in the street and see where they could find some good chocolate ice cream or something, and that was the end of it. You know, the Baha'is, okay, some of them, but considering that he spoke to thousands of people coming across the United States, it's hardly a commensurate response what existed afterwards. So that makes it just move slower, but it was still a great victory, and it brought the faith out of the that difficult period with Muhammad Ali. And so crisis and victory is, is essential to the release of new divine powers, a further outpouring, as Shoghi Fendi says, of divine grace. Uh, we had this uh, even, I would say at this point, mini crisis, although it was quite a crisis, that one of the hands of the cause should have deviated from the course and decided that he could be guardian of the faith before the establishment of the House of Justice. And in the conclave where they said they're calling for the election of the House of Justice, he said, I can't sign this. And, and they said that, uh, okay, you can't stay in the Holy Land. Then you have to leave. And if you're quiet, we'll be quiet. And Mason Remy went back to Washington and in a couple months proclaimed his own guardianship and sent a message to the Baha'i world. He had quite a range of people he could send to. He sent to all the national assemblies. He sent to the American National Assembly and called upon them to prepare a commission to receive him at the airport. He was going to fly to their convention so he could be presented to the national convention. Well, they were all kind of, imagine, overwhelmed. And uh, the hands in the Holy Land, of course, had to deal with that. But that crisis was preparatory to the strengthening of the covenant 
and the emergence then of the universal election of the first universal house of justice in 1963. So these things are going forward. And I think, you know, the crisis that we had in Chile with all this property, it's a smaller level, has uh, produced a, an outcome of this marvelous temple site that we have now. And uh, also th certain things have shifted, the value of the Canadian dollar, the value of the European euro, that's going to make it more accessible to finish the construction of it with the, with the support of the friends. The next, next stages uh, of the unfoldment of the divine plan, we don't know what new crises will come, come forth in the world, but there's always something. And these uh, same, the cyclical operation of that operates not only at the world level, but at the national community level. You see national communities go in and out of crisis and have these further outpouring than if they, friends hold firm to the cause that uh, carries them forward. And you can see this as what we were talking about earlier. Each level can be compared to another level lower, so the next level down is the individual. And we see how in our own lives uh, we're, uh, we face crises, and if we face them in the right way and we draw on the right confirmations that come to us in, because God sends tests to us, we also produce tests through our foolishness, but he's also the God that designed that, so he lets that also be an effort. And some of the friends just make bad mistakes along the way, serving the cause, thinking they're doing something good. And Abdul Baha has commented on that once. God uses the mistakes of the friends to advance the faith as well. He's able to do all kinds of things. So don't worry too much about making big mistakes. Uh, when we speak to friends, of course, we, we invoke the greatest name. We hope we'll say the right thing to the hearts that will open the hearts and make them attractive to the faith. And certainly the, uh, the Ruri Institute process is providing more and more, a much, much broader basis of Baha'is with the, with the uh, tools and skills they need to be able to deliver the message effectively. And this was the intention of the, of the House originally calling for institutes to be established, and finally with the maturation of the Ruhi Institute, it became a means for that, and the House has been supportive of it. It's, yes, it's true, it's come out of Colombia, but it does address all kinds of people. I mean, you, you can see that in your own community, how some of the older Baha'is say, well, I know all this, you know, what am I studying this for? You're studying it because the House of Justice asks you to study it. And why do they ask you to study it? So that you'll understand what the new Baha'is, what the range of knowledge and training they're being given so that you can connect with it and not you know, overwhelm them with some other information. That All of that being said, mm -hmm. Certainly, we should give our best support to that and learn it as well as we can. But beyond that is the basic uh, obligation and duty of every Baha'i to study the cause and to teach the cause and to study the writings in, in a thorough way. And we may not be doing that in, in a very organized manner at the moment because of the emphasis on these core activities. But that doesn't release us as individuals from not going to the books and studying them in a systematic, progressive way as called for by the Guardian in the Advent of Divine Justice, which the House of Justice has been pointing back to those requirements in, in its recent messages. We need to go back and look at those and think about those and see whether we have, have we done that in a, in a conscientious manner. And the study of these writings, as we said earlier, is the source of all kinds of excitement for us. It maybe seems overwhelming when we think of it, but it does then gradually inform us and raise the level of our vision and the level of our faith and the level of our confidence and the level of the confirmation that we become aware of and can use in the service of the cause. The progressive release of divine energies through the radiance of the cause gradually has overspread the whole surface of the globe you, you see these words that in Shoghi Fendi's writings that also have been mentioned in the book. To infuse, to diffuse, and to suffuse. The infusion into the heart of the manifestation of God and then consequently into creation itself of these original 
creative, divine creative energies out into the world. Everything with an increased potentiality. He says every, even the most commonplace of words, if it's used in the Revelation, it has a, a potency, a power. It reveals something that we can't associate with the word before it was used in that way in the Revelation. And the heroic primitive ages of the faith is particularly associated with this infusion process of the, the two uh, successive revelations of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. Then in the time of the formative age of the faith, after the master is also busy filling the world with divine potentialities, we have the revelation of the tablets of the divine plan, and that is the, the charter for the teaching and propagation of the faith. Propagation may be in the sense of organized teaching of the faith. And Shoghi Fendi prepared first instruments in the form of the local assemblies, the national assemblies, local and national committees, until he had the world primed with those first national assemblies, maybe what, eight or nine of them in all. And then he called upon different national communities to carry out the first stage of the systematic prosecution of the divine plan content. And America had the great uh, lion's share of that, of that task. And America was called upon to create a seven-year plan. Well, it sounds like they organized it themselves, but Shoghi Effendi pretty much, he called upon them, he asked for their ideas, and then he said, okay, open every province of Canada, every state of the United States, and, and every nation, major nation of Latin America to the cause. And the friends began doing that. In parallel with that, he was developing the um, superstructure of the temple in Wilmette. And there's, in the book, not in what you have before you today, but in, in the book it outlines some of the things he said about how that institution of the Mashakalaskars, as it came into being, was releasing further potentialities into the community. He also talks about the impact of the forces released by the holding of a Baha'i Convention. All these different events add to the, to the sparkle and the radiance of the cause in the world. And these 41 conferences we had, everybody who was involved in any of those realizes what a potential that released into the world, the excitement of the Baha'is to see each other and to be participating in the plans and so on. This is the diffusion. The diffusion of the light is the spreading of the light over the surface, if you will, of, of the world. And the first uh, uh, believers that went out, particularly Martha Root and Leonor Armstrong, Leonor Halsepel at that time, Leonor Halsepel Armstrong, went to South America. And then the Duns who went to Australia and the Noblock sisters and d different ones that went out all over the world, they performed this function of the first people on different continents. And that uh, was an amaz amazing period. I don't know how many of you know that Konum was pioneering as a young woman in Germany as the rise of, of Hitler and Nazism was taking place. And she saw some of that herself. She sometimes testified. You, know, you could feel the this man had a terrific vibration and effect on people. And um, it was during that period that she came with her mother to the Holy Land and Shoghi Fendi asked for her hand in marriage. And she was married in 1937, as was mentioned last night. So this is the diffusion. Then Shoghi Fendi finally, he brought that to a consummation at the beginning of the World Crusade where he named 130 territories of all the territories that were named in the divine plan. There remained 130 of them to still open to the cause. And he asked the Baha'is all over the world to arise, but particularly to ask the North Americans to arise. And whenever he asked other nations to arise and fulfill these goals, he said that if they're not, uh, if they're not able to fulfill them, then the North Americans. It was up to that time. Now, by that time, Canada and the U.S. had come apart, but pr prior to 48, Canada and uh, the United States were one single Baha'i community. So 
Shoghi Effendi, you, you'll see in the divine plan how the tablets are, are revealed to both. And in that sense, Canada is a co-inheritor of the divine plan. And he, the chief ally of, of the chief executors in its execution in the world. Uh, Shoghi Effendi first directed the, the Baha'is at that stage to the Latin American countries, and a number of outstanding Baha'is and teachers went traveling and settled into Latin America. And um, the story of that will be released in a book, I should think, within a year or so. The, now the collected messages of Shoghi Effendi to Latin America is ready to be published. That will be the last of the great volumes of Shoghi Effendi's messages to different parts of the world. And uh, it will reveal through the Guardian's messages that Shoghi Effendi considered the Latin American Baha'is as the associates, the chief associates in the execution of the divine plan. And he said this was because of the kindly words that Baha'u'llah addresses to the leaders of the American republics in, in the Kitab-i Akhtas. And that, that, that those words had endowed them with the potentiality of bringing into being the spirit of what Baha'u'llah has called for, the, the um, mending of the, of the wounded and the suffering of the, and raising a crown of glory on those countries, which implications are for the future establishment of large Baha'i communities and finally Baha'i states in those lands. He said all the other countries of the world are auxiliaries in the execution of the divine plan. And UK, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, was the chief auxiliary at that time. They'd been helping with Africa and had done different things. And he said they, they should carry the faith to the remainder of the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth, of course, was then deteriorating in the British Empire. The sun never set on the British Empire until the 1950s when it stopped setting a number of places. But that, he said, didn't remove the responsibility of the British Baha'is to carry the light of Baha'u'llah to those territories. And they did a, a number of extraordinary things. But the rise of communism in the Eastern Bloc countries and so on kept the faith from reaching a number of those territories. And the House of Justice had watched this process very closely. And by mm, 88, 89, uh, Sakhalin had been open to the faith. Mongolia had been open to the faith. There was now the possibility of finishing the scroll of the Knights of Baha'u'llah that Shoghi Effendi had begun by filling in the names of the other people who were the first ones to arrive. The first year, whoever arrived in those places was included. So you'll see there's a number of knights for certain places around the world because they all arrived within the first year. But then after that first year, whoever arrived first was became the Knight of Baha'u'llah for that. And uh, the House of Justice then f finished that scroll. It was beautifully restored and boxed and uh, placed on the occasion of the centenary of Baha'u'llah's ascension at the threshold just after the stairs where you go into the inner shrine of Baha'u'llah. The, there was a, a casket placed under the floor there, so all the pilgrims and everyone walks over the top of that and remembers these holy souls who went out and completed the diffusion of the light of Baha'u'llah. Now Shoghi Effendi talks about another word, suffuse, suffusion, which is the penetration of that light now into the very life of these communities in another way, in a, in a much fuller way. And it takes centuries really to do it, but we're starting it now. And the, the whole... Uh, new phase of the divine plan, the new culture that we read about, the, that we're trying to do, has to do with this raising up manpower and moving forward with the process of suffusion. So you want to remember these words, the infusion of the original powers of the revelation, the diffusion of that light over the surface of the entire planet, and now the suffusion into the roots and, and really the, the life, the cultural life of these countries slowly but surely. He talks about that the divine civilization that's come needs to see the creative energies released by Baha'u'llah's world order. We talked a little bit about administrative order. It administers the Baha'i affairs. It administers the Baha'i community. It does not interfere generally with politics. 
and it doesn't uh, uh, have all the powers of the octas. But that gradually gives way in the future to the establishment of local Baha'i communities where the, uh, the uh, local spiritual assembly will take on the character of local houses of justice and will have national houses of justice in some of these countries. Shoghi Effendi had foreseen that that would happen in the Middle East and had made a tentative goal, circumstances permitting during the crusade, for the establishment of Baha'i courts in Jordan and Lebanon and Egypt and those places. Why, why did he do this? Because the only recourse for civil law, for individual law, for questions of inheritance and marriage and divorce were vested in religious bodies in those countries. And the Baha'is had no place to go. Basically, they, they had to either go to a Christian or a Muslim court for, for any of that. And in some of the places, Shogun Pindi says, they will marry themselves and they won't have any legality until this is recognized. And the process has come pretty close a couple of times in Jordan, but then it's gotten blocked by fanatical forces that said, no, you can't characterize the Baha'is as a religion that can have a court. And there the national spiritual assemblies of those countries would be the natural objects of such a, a situation. So that's still ahead of us. We don't know how that'll work. In a sense, it, uh, it has happened in the Holy Land. The House of Justice uh, has recognition as has an international treaty or covenant with the government, and it's considered international in character. And the government allows the House of Justice through its representatives to perform marriages in the Holy Land, was there was no by marriage otherwise. And so that has taken place. And uh, I can tell you that there have been a number of marriages in the Holy Land. <laughs> my, my wife and I think we were counting up that we've been to about 350 of them. <laughs> Quite enough for a lifetime, friends. Just leave me out of your marriage if you're going <laughs> to. So, so this is a, another process. This leads then to the gradual emergence of an assembly that begins to take on civil responsibilities in a community. And overall in the world, Shoghi Effendi said we move from this mm, obscurity to persecution to a, a form of, um, uh, what's the word for liberalizing or for? Hmm? Legitimize is kind of like that. It's not quite to that recognition stage. There's a stage in there where it's, it becomes equal with the other faiths. It's recognized as a limited recognition and then it has full recognition as an independent religion, which then, as that grows, moves into a stage where it can become the state religion when enough people in the country are the followers of the faith, uh, short of becoming a Baha'i state. And then Shoghi Fendi says, eventually it emerges then as a Baha'i state in the future. And it's these Baha'i states that are the, the signs of the world order of Baha'u'llah. And he says that the, when the majority of states in the world become Baha'i states, they will then opt to form a world commonwealth of Baha'i states. And that's what the Baha'i world commonwealth that you read about that. He, he leaves it in veiled way. It, you don't want to provoke people with it. It's all dependent on the free will of the masses of mankind, whether this comes about or not. So. Because you want to be careful the way you talk about it in public so that you don't frighten people and say, oh, they're going to take over the world, you know, something. Because that's what the enemies want to say. But you can't take over the world until you get the people to believe in the faith. <laughs> and then it's God's right to, to guide mankind the way he will. And he's given us this revelation to move us toward that. And this emergence of world order eventually, we're talking about several hundreds of years, as far as I can understand. Then. In fact, if we don't begin moving faster, it could be longer than that. Then we move into the, the stage of the commonwealth and the proclamation of the most great peace. And Shoghi Fendi talked in simple terms. He said, the lesser peace is the political unity of mankind. And the most great peace is the spiritualization of that unity. The, the uh, masses of mankind embracing the spiritual truths and the spiritual energies, creative energies of the revelation, transforming them into new entities and 
creating new possibilities for the human race. And of course, that's the, we have the political unification of mankind with the lesser peace, and then gradually the diffusion of the faith, the embracing spiritualization of the masses, leading eventually to these other possibilities in the future. So, so it's good to have in your mind the distinction between administrative order and world order, and world commonwealth, and then still beyond that, world civilization. Then he says that the light released by Baha'u'llah will continue through millenniums to illumine mankind. So the central position of Baha'u'llah as the universal manifestation of God, as he's called by Shoghi Effendi and by drawing on Abdul Baha's uh, descriptions, is something that's going to be with mankind a long time, a growing awareness on the planet. Now, how did all this come about? I mean, I just mentioned that uh, as I became aware of these various passages that are quoted here in the second half of, of the book, because about half the book is are passages taken from Shoghi Fendi's writings about these forces of, of light and darkness. Uh, before we had... Uh, computer programs and search systems and all like there are now. The only way to do this was to read through Shoghi Effendi's messages from the beginning in 1922-23 until 1957. So I don't know how many times I read them all, extracting all of these things and writing down the quotes little by little, until I had a huge pile of papers, and one quote on each paper. And then started rereading them and organizing them according to subject matter. You can do this with almost any subject in the faith, and it's a lot easier now because you can type it in on the keyboard. I think there's a certain loss, you know, I don't want to say, it sounds romantic to say that it's better to do the long struggling way, but it is very good because I found by reading it, by identifying it, by writing it down, then by classifying it, then by typing it clean into a notebook, gradually I had the basis for this book and the course of, of study that we're looking at now. And working on the same basis on the book on immortality, on the character, how is character of immortality, in, in the, particularly in the writings of the Master and Baha'u'llah? That's another subject to come up. That's a subject that's somehow close to all of us, <laughs> since we're all going that direction, <laughs> some faster than others. but <laughs> So uh, maybe I'm looking at that for my own interests now. <laughs> the um, first course on this was presented at uh, Lou Helen in 1984. And Florence Mayberry, Mayberry was there. She, she gave a course, a parallel course, and I remember Paul Lample was one of the students in that course, and we got, that's where we got to know him. And, of course, he's, he's uh, acting on the knowledge of these same things in his services now to the House of Justice. The, uh, the way Shoghi Effendi focuses us on the universe of Baha'u'llah's words is, is a very important one. He gives us a model. Everything he did is condensed. So I, I found that eventually when I realized that God passes by, Shoghi Effendi had taken the time to characterize each of the works of Baha'u'llah and list their major contents, particularly the Kitab Igan, where he lists some 19 points related to the contents of the Igan, made a terrific entry gate to go and study the Egon and see if he could identify which passages related to those phrases that he'd, he'd used to characterize the book. He does the same thing with the Tablets to the Kings. Uh, this, this is, those Tablets to the Kings are closely related to a work that he wrote in 1941 at the outset of the Second World War called The Promised Day Has Come. Perhaps you'll remember that you know, he talks about this tempest and fury that's hitting the world in the first opening paragraphs. Uh, that, that book is quite parallel to the kind of materials that uh, are here in the forces of light and darkness. And it has an analysis of the effects 
uh, in the world of those forces upon those elements that didn't respond to Baha'u'llah's call and invitation, what happened to them. And worth looking at again in the light of what's happening in the world today to revisit that. It's a terrific, terrific book of Shoghi Effendi's, terrific message. So, in these writings of Shoghi Effendi, when, I think when the believers first had all these various tablets of Baha'u'llah uh, in Baha'i scriptures and in some of the early publications, way back at the opening of the century as Abdul Baha was moving around, it was uh, definitely overwhelming to know how to, how to see that, which work was more important than another work, what was the major subject of a work, how to approach uh, organizing Baha'i knowledge. And he talks about this in, in God Passes By as well. You know, there was, I mean, at the first, the tablets were revealed and they were hidden, they were eaten, they were all kinds of things happening to the early Babis, you know, to, to have these words. And then, then they, the, they were greatly expanded in the time of Baha'u'llah by his own words and in, with the writings of Abba Baha. And finally, in the period of the guardianship, they were systematized, at least the initial stages of systematization of all of the content of the revelation. And Shoghi Effendi's review basically of that is in God Passes By. You can find it there. You can look at the various stages of it. He does review the development. One of the things is the development of Baha'i literature from the very furtive and, and uh, precarious stage until finally we reached the stage now where the House of Justice has uh, this institution for the study of the, of the t holy texts on, on Mount Carmel, which makes these summaries of the writings and presents uh, preliminary translations to the House of Justice of, of this vast revelation. As I say, six million words of Baha'u'llah. So it's come a long ways. You you have the privilege of, kind of retracing its steps by your study of Shoghi Fendi's writings, by a book like God Passes By and Promised Day Has Come. Certainly you want to study the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. This letter of Shoghi Fendi is so essential. I remember our first Baha'i teachers told us we should be reading it every six months. Because you you change, and the perception you have of these writings changes with you. And this is confirmed in a very interesting way in uh, Nader's summary of the writings of the Bab, Nader Sahidi's book. He quotes from the Bab, in one place he quotes from the Bab, he says that the every verse of the divine revelation, every verse, every word, Every letter of every word and of every verse has infinite divine meanings. It has oceans of meanings flowing within it. Torrents of divine significances. All right, you kind of listen to that. And then he says, and know thou that these meanings have secret meanings behind them. <laughs> Each one. Each verse, each word, each letter. In some of the, he writes a book 750 pages long on the meaning of the Surah of Kosar. Kosar is this river of divine bounty that flows out of the throne of the Lord in the other world. Not that you're familiar with that, but anyway, that's, <laughs> that's there. And he writes 750 pages on it. And he does this. He says, what's the meaning of the surah as a whole? What's the meaning of the first verse, the second verse, the third verse? What's the meaning of the first word of the first verse, the second word? What's the meaning of the first letter of the first word in relation to the second letter of the first word and the third letter and the fourth letter? Just pours it out, you know. You've seen some hints of that in the uh, Seven Valleys where Baha'u'llah says something about the, I don't know, was it sparrow or some bird? It's the name of the bird. And he says the first letter signifies this, second letter that. So, Divine, infinite divine meanings. It gets a little obscure when you're trying to figure it out in English, but in any case, these, these divine verses have, have these interrelationships. Secret meanings, he says, that, and meditate on these. So, then he says, and know thou that these secret meanings have recondite meanings behind those secret meanings. And then he says, these recondite meanings have mysterious meanings behind that. 
He goes five levels, and then he says, and so on. <laughs> so you have these torrents of divine meanings pouring through every verse of the divine writings, actually, and then there are accessible behind these, depending on the degrees of your perception and penetration, these other divine meanings. Now, on the other hand, he says that the soul passes through different stages in the development of its vision. Its initial vision is a physical vision. And it sees things and interprets things, divine things. This world of the outer mortal world, which he calls the Nasut, which is actually a divine world as well. This is not made by the devil. It's made by God. And it has its divine purposes. And it's a wonderful world. I mean, apart from how dangerous it is. <laughs> <laughs> how dangerous it is for the soul, how dangerous it is for the self. But we have the remedy at hand to lift us to a point of vision where we can, with physical vision, perceive all kinds of things that help us understand. And that goes back to what we were saying this morning about the, the two books of God, the book of creation and the book of revelation, how they interact on each other and in our understanding too. Okay, so... Um, Where do we need to go now? Just a minute. So he says that after the physical vision is the that awakening of the physical eye to see in a divine manner. There's the awakening of the spiritual eye. And he said that is another stage. And that the soul, when it, that eye awakens, it perceives something else from these divine verses and the world around it. It has another way of seeing things. And then he talk, talks about another stage above that, which he calls the eye of the intellect. But this eye of the intellect is more the eye of universal mind rather than intellect as popularly understood in these, in these times, where it's usually something dry and dusty. Not intended. What he's talking about, the eye of the intellect, is that eye reinforced by the powers of the universal mind, which he says diffuses its radiance into all creation. So if you become aware of that, then you also see, the, see some of these other levels. So it's as if, if the, each eye adds to the other eye and there's an ascension of vision until the fourth stage, which he says is the eye of the inner heart opens. And this eye of the inner heart, he says, is very difficult to attain to. It's called the fawad for the those that you know Persian and Arabic. And he says, this eye, when it opens, then it's is the only eye capable of understanding the mysteries of divine unity. Now you see how many times in the writings we have references to divine unity. I mean, what does it mean? There's one passage that Shoghi Effendi has cited in the gleanings, where he says that this divine unity means that whatever the manifestation does, his actions, his words, his deeds, Everything is in conformity with the will of God. Not the same as God, but the, he can't deviate from that, you know? And sometimes Baha'u'llah complains about it. He said, I would have, you know, been happy to welcome the dagger of a, an assassin. But God has restrained him and calls on me to instead speak out. I, I like to think about this, the, the crossing of this coming up and at each level, opening up of new worlds of expansion of vision according to these inner recondite meanings of the, of the verses and so on. This should forever remove any conflict among the Baha'is about what the meaning of the verses is. It takes it all away. It just diffuses it. Because wherever you are is not where I am, and I'm going to see one thing in the writings, you're going to see something in the other in the writings. It doesn't mean everything you see in the writings is right, but I have to at least concede that you're seeing something that I don't see. And you yourself know, if you've taken the hidden words this week, and then you read them next week, you find something different. Because the circumstances of life, Baha'u'llah, you're saying your prayers, and we are told that these obligatory prayers, and the recitation of divine verses morning and evening, and the use of the greatest name, are the essential means for the spiritual progress of the human soul. If he thought that transcendental meditation was necessary for the best of you, he would have told us, but he hadn't told us that. So his silence on the subject and developing psychic powers or anything else like that to make us more spiritual, 
He doesn't say anything about that. So Shoghi Effendi says in letters written on his behalf that we have to trust that the, the basic things that Baha'u'llah has given, the supreme manifestation of God, those basic things that he's given are the source of, of our transformation and change and hold to them. God help us. The, the obligatory prayers, Abdu'l Baha says, okay, he says there's only uh, two excuses for not saying the obligatory prayers. One is illness, extreme illness, and the other is insanity. So take your choice if you're not. <laughs> it seems slight. Why does God need my obligatory prayer? He, for heaven's sakes, doesn't need your obligatory prayer. But he's told you that you need your obligatory prayer. And that's why it's so, so important. And in one of the, the, one of the things, it says you're free to choose one of the three obligatory prayers. There's nothing that says you have to choose one. You can say all three of them. You can say the short and the medium and the long one. In fact, sometimes there's periods in our life where you think, well, maybe that's what I need to do. And if you do that, I don't know, it takes 25 minutes a day or 20 minutes a day out of 24 hours, really not a lot of time, you know. We think, oh, God is leaning on us and giving us all kinds of obligations. He doesn't need that, you know. We don't, we, we, he tells us he's totally independent of that. And yet the manifestation himself rejoices when we obey the laws and, and we each, each with each stage of that reflect the powers of the faith in a greater manner. So sometimes very simple things become very important. Uh, and the, the meaning of the fast is the same thing. I remember I gave a talk about the importance of the fast in one big city one time. A lady came up afterwards and she said, oh, I liked your talk so much. She says, unfortunately, I can't fast. It makes me hungry. <laughs> uh, I didn't know what to say. I said, oh, <laughs> just giving a talk on the subject. You know, what can you do? So this comes back to, um, I think we're running over time, are we? Hmm? No. Yes. No. We're going to have some questions and answers later this evening and some opportunities. We can talk some more about this. But I want to come back, and you'll have to remind me if I don't come back to it, these four things that in the last years of Shoghi Fendi he was emphasizing, particularly through letters written by Leroy Iowas, that is prayer, meditation, study and action, and the equilibrium and balance which needs to exist in our life between these. Thank you very much.